My name is Larry Chartrand. and I'm going to uh, moderate this panel uh, for this afternoon on uh, jurisprudential challenges and regarding the Daniels case. And I have the distinct pleasure of introducing our distinguished panel uh, who will be talking about some of the legal implications of the Daniels decision. Um, our first speaker is uh, Eric Adams. And uh, Eric is a professor of law here at the University of Alberta, where he currently has uh, a Killam Annual Professorship, which is great. Um, he also began, interestingly enough, uh, as a civil litigator in Toronto and briefly acted for the plaintiffs at the outset of the litigation in the Daniels case, which is something I didn't know. Um, he's an award-winning teacher and scholar. Uh, he's published widely in the fields of constitutional law, legal history, employment law, and legal education. And so it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Eric uh, for this panel. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, tepid applause. That was great. Um, uh, in, a, in addition to the, uh, the, all the compliments about how uh, uh, well organized this conference is, which I heartily endorse, the organizers are also incredibly brave because at the end of a long day they've put three lawyers on. Um, so that's courageous. Uh, kudos. Um, I, I, it was mentioned that I did uh, briefly work on uh, this uh, case when I was a civil litigator, and uh, I was honored to do so. Uh, but I just, of course, want to make clear I, I haven't worked on the case since about 2007, and uh, these are just personal uh, views that I'll be expressing today. I should also say this next anecdote was going to work better if, if Jason Madden had appeared on the panel before me, but I once worked at the same law firm as Jason Madden, and about three-quarters of the lawyers uh, at that firm thought I was Jason Madden, um, and uh, I know that because they would give me work, they'd say, here you go, Jason, and uh, it was such interesting stuff, I just started saying yes, so I, I want to ap <laughs> apologize to Jason. Um, does that mean that I've claimed to be Métis? I, I'm a little worried about that now. I, 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 but uh, I'm sad he wasn't able to be here. I was raised in the territory of uh, Robinson uh, Superior Treaty, the Korean and Anishinaabe uh, lands of uh, Northwest, and Métis lands of Northwestern Ontario. I'm speaking today as a constitutional lawyer, scholar, and legal historian, but also as a dad, which basically means that um, I, I have a head cold from November to April. So let's hope my voice uh, carries on. I'll do my best. Well, I recognize uh, many of the criticism, criticisms that have been leveled against uh, Daniels uh, today and, and yesterday. I, I remain of the view that the decision was the correct one, indeed the, the only possible one, given the evidence that was before the court. And, and I'm actually hopeful that it, it will provide a framework uh, for ongoing uh, just uh, reconciliation. Uh, for understandable reasons, however, the decision and, and certainly the interpretation of that decision, as, as Chris Anderson pointed out last night and, and Adam uh, Gowdry seconded uh, this afternoon, the decision and its, interpreta and its interpretation has collapsed three concepts, which I think it's important to, to try and pry apart, which is, which is how I'll spend my time today. And those three concepts identify as, as history, constitutional jurisdiction, and identity and citizenship. Despite the pressures to, to treat those as one and the same, I want to use my time to argue that the court's decision in Daniels, especially when placed in, in conversation with other Canadian constitutional decisions, creates space for what really matters, uh, crown recognition, respect, and negotiations with Canada's uh, Indigenous peoples. And crucially, in my view, the continuing autonomy of Indigenous peoples and the communities and nations uh, that, uh, that they constitute to define their own uh, membership status according to their own laws. I think Daniels uh, actually d doesn't do a bad job of setting us on that road. So let me tell you why. And first, to do that, I'll, I'll turn to each of those three concepts, history, jurisdiction, and identity and citizenship. First, history. My work uh, in the Daniels litigation included analysis of uh, thousands of historical records. In the trial itself, there were six weeks of evidence adduced, uh, consisting of 800 exhibits drawn from some 15,000 historical documents. 
All of that evidence was geared towards answering a seemingly straightforward constitutional question, what is the meaning of Section 9124 of the Constitution Act of 1867, which grants federal jurisdiction, as we all know, to Indians and the lands reserved for the Indians? Answering that question seems simple enough, Proof difficult, has always proven difficult, for I think at least two reasons. The first is that there's virtually no mention of what the framers of Confederation uh, thought that term meant, either in Confederation debates or in the negotiations leading up to Confederation. There's a silence in the record on that uh, key question. And the second reason why that question has proved difficult is that uh, history on the ground of what that term meant both before and after con Confederation has demonstrated no clear consistency, set definition, or even core uh, truths. The reason for that, I think, is that the term is, in one sense, completely meaningless. It's a racist category invented by settlers and their governments as a way of making sense of a complex indigenous world that they simply did not understand, didn't take the effort to understand, but felt to, compelled to control um, by an ideology of white supremacy and by the imperatives of, of, of settler sovereignty. As historians have amply demonstrated, for whites, race has always functioned as a fluid construct, a means of achieving particular ends, not as a thing unto itself. Race was not ever intended to mean one thing. It was intended to mean many things, to provide a full box of tools to be selected from as the occasion required. Some groups, say Italians and Jews, they could be white for some purposes, but not for others. Light-skinned blacks in Canadian history could be admitted to restricted hotels when business was bad, but excluded when business was good, and on and on and on. Historians of race, race and ethnicity and legal history have demonstrated uh, these stories in countless encounters with the law. We see a similar fluidity in, in the meaning of Indian. It meant what it needed to be, to, to be meant uh, for a particular purpose uh, in the government's uh, interests. When control over people was the objective, uh, then the concept could expand to broadly cover all kinds of indigenous people and communities. When assimilation or the distribution of benefits was the objective, the definition of Indian could be minimalized or shrunk to cover some smaller group of indigenous peoples. As the trial judge recognized, any definition of Indian was established to suit the purposes of the statute, is what Justice Phelan said. Accordingly, the definition of the Indian Act, sorry, the, the, the definition of Indian in the Federal Indian Act grew more restrictive and exclusionary over time. Indeed, by the mid-1940s, the federal government was explicitly engaged in a project of reducing the number of Indians under the Indian Act embarking on ambitious projects across Canada to remove people from ban lists. We had 664 people removed from the ban list over a period of just five years, Malcolm McCrinnon, chief of the Reserve Division, boasted to his colleagues in 1947, speaking specifically about northern Alberta. At times, internal discussions within government recognized the unfairness of that history of restriction. A 1976 internal cabinet memo indicated that the Indian Act is in some ways arbitrary, anachronistic, and harsh in excluding certain classes of individuals. The non-status Indians and Métis suffer severe disadvantage such that provincial activities alone are unlikely to significantly ameliorate their situation for the foreseeable future, is what the cabinet heard in 1976. But although courts take account of history and they recognize the use of history for the purposes of answering legal questions before it, it's important to remember that Daniels is not the writing of history. Courts do not write and research history. They use and employ history for particular purposes. It is wrong to treat the Daniels decision as providing a history of the Métis Nation. It doesn't do that. It's wrong to think that it's it's writing a history of indigenous settler relations or really history of any topic. It, its history is partial and driven by the interests of the parties, by the constraints of the litigation process. It is true that sometimes judicial rhetoric and the confident prose of judges gives a false impression of laying down a definitive account of what happened. 
but in all my legal, re legal history research, I have discovered time and again, legal accounts of what happened is only a partial, if even that, account of the truth. We need to resist that impulse. Despite the sweep of the evidence offered in the case, the history that matters in Daniels concerns a very narrow issue. What does history tell us about the constitutional meaning of section 9124? What the framers thought that meant and how it was used? We need to leave the broader and particular histories of colonialism and of the Métis Nation to respectful, community-engaged researchers and the communities themselves. Jurisdiction next. The question of jurisdiction is related to but distinct from that history. Determining the meaning of heads of power under a constitutional document is influenced by history but not determined by it. The Constitution is intended to provide a flexible framework in which governments can constitutionally exercise their legislative authorities. What do I mean by that? I mean that courts have consistently held that the heads of power under the Constitution derive their meaning from the interaction of three sources. Number one, the words of the text. Number two, the philosophical, linguistic, and historical contexts of that text. And three, what's called the living tree doctrine, which stipulates that constitutional meaning must be capable of development over time to address new realities, new context, and to remain uh, and retain relevance and legitimacy among those subject to its rule. All three of those factors pushed overwhelmingly in the same direction in the Daniels case, that Indian in section 9124 effectively means indigenous. The government's early position in the litigation was that it alone could define the constitutional meaning of Indian, and it did so under the Indian Act. That position was and is preposterous. The Constitution, of course, is supreme. Any head of power authorizes government action. Government acting under that power cannot limit or amend that constitutional head of power. It is its own thing. Imagine, for example, if the federal government in exercising its jurisdiction over lighthouses passed a, a piece of legislation dealing only with Atlantic lighthouses. That would not make BC-based lighthouses no longer lighthouses. They are still lighthouses for the purposes of the Constitution. As the court stressed in Daniels, jurisdiction over a matter only authorizes the ability to pass laws in relation to that subject. It does not create an obligation or duty to legislate. As in other cases in Canadian constitutional law, the court also declined to definitively define the outer limits of that head of power. And I think it was wise to do so. Constitutional conceptions, like the complex country that they are intended to govern, must continue to find expression in new realities, unforeseen developments, and ideas that we don't yet possess. As a matter of constitutional jurisdiction, the Daniels decision, I think, is really unimpeachable. The federal government has, and it always has had, constitutional jurisdiction in relation to indigenous nations, communities, and peoples. It is not just because the history says that that must be the case, although the history, I think, does say that, but because as a matter of constitutional law, it is the only sensible interpretation of the Constitution when considering its language, its purpose, its context, and the present imperatives that call for national recognition, respect, and negotiation with indigenous peoples between the federal government and Canada's indigenous peoples. Finally, what does Daniels tell us about identity and citizenship? We've heard a fair bit about this already. Just as history does not define constitutional jurisdiction, neither should we allow constitutional jurisdiction to define identity and citizenship of the Métis Nation, or of any other indigenous peoples for that matter. Daniels and the constitutional jurisdiction it recognized did not create a single new Métis person or community. It did not do that. It did not have that impact. If people think that on Twitter, those people are wrong. We should speak out against it. The new claims for status and identity that we've seen in the wake of Daniels is 
politics. And politics is supposed to be messy. We saw this in the wake of the Powley decision, and we see it in the wake of Daniels. And in my view, it's entirely healthy for communities themselves and on the ground to debate and determine and enforce their citizenship norms. Wisely and appropriately, except for one throwaway line in paragraph, seven, or paragraph 17, which some people have pointed to, I don't think the court says very much about whether or not particular individuals fall within federal jurisdiction because of their indigeneity. It proposes no test to answer that question, and I think that's exactly right. Of all the legal contributions offered by Daniels, I'm intrigued by this silence and think that that silence may be its most important. The identity, status, and citizenship of Canada's indigenous peoples, communities, and nations must be determined not by fiats of the court, but by the laws and practices of the indigenous communities themselves. I think Daniels gives them the space to continue to do exactly that. It's also crucial to remember that, as courts have repeatedly recognized, sometimes differential treatment is the precise requirement of a just and substantively equal society. As much as constitutional lawyers fixate on charter of rights and freedoms, our constitutional order is one of difference. If federalism and the treaties and Aboriginal title and rights tell us anything about Canada, it's that we can exist in a complex place in which groups and communities and people are treated differently in furtherance of a goal of justice. Daniels does not change that. We must continue to demand that respecting diversity and the circumstances of individual indigenous peoples is what should guide the crown in its relationship to indigenous pe peoples, not a one-size-fits-all approach. In my view, like MMF, the Daniels decision sets the federal government on a path to finally recognize and respect the Métis Nation as a constitutional partner. Daniels tell us that the constitutional jurisdiction to do exactly that exists does not tell us how precisely to re that respect and recognition should take shape, that's good. We don't want courts to do that. We want people and governments to do that. That, in my view, is the challenge that Daniel leaves to us. It's a gift, and it's an opportunity to get it right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Eric. Um, our next speaker is uh, Professor Catherine Bell. Uh, Professor Bell is here at the University of Alberta in the Faculty of Law. Uh, she specializes in Indigenous law and has been a visiting uh, scholar at various national and international universities and has developed and, and been involved with uh, many programs like the program for uh, program of Legal Studies for Native People at the University of Saskatchewan, um, and been involved with the Akitsurak uh, Law School, the, the law school for Inuit uh, students up in, up in Iqaluit, and the Banff Center for Management, Aboriginal Leadership, and Self-Government. Uh, Professor Bell has had a, a long and distinguished career and has published uh, many books and many articles on Aboriginal rights and on Métis issues in particular. Uh, in fact, uh, in 2012, she was honored with the C you know, Canadian Bar Association Governor General's Gold Medal for outstanding contributions to the development of law and legal education in Canada. Her current research uh, is on issues of jurisdiction in honor of the Crown in implementing modern constitutional and other solemn promises to Métis as part of the Métis Treaties Project uh, that Catherine Bell um, is involved with, and just as, as a side note, just for kind of commercial, uh, commercial purposes, uh, I just wanted to make, uh, make you aware of the Métis Treaties Project. It is uh, a study of uh, Métis Treaties, both past, present, and, and looking towards treaties as a model for dealing with Métis Canadian issues more generally in the future. So um, there is a website called Métis Treaties Project, all one word, if you're more interested in, or if you're interested in, 
and learning more about that research project. In fact, a number of the presenters today and tomorrow are um, a part of that project. So with that, I'd like to uh, welcome Catherine Bell uh, up to the podium. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Larry. I just want to take a minute, as others have before me, to acknowledge uh, the elders who are here today, Maria Campbell and uh, Elmer Ghostkeeper, and how wonderful it is to reconnect with Elmer again and some of my friends from the settlements. And I also want to take the opportunity to acknowledge three other very important people who have been helping me in the Métis Treaty projects, and that's uh, Nick Kunitz, uh, Matt Schneider, and Krista McFadden, uh, three law students who are here today and who will keep working with me on the project. So thank you, you three, for helping to keep me on my feet in these very, very uh, busy times. In Daniels, actually, three declarations were sought. The first one is the one that we've really been focusing on a lot over the last two days, and that is the declaration uh, that Métis are Indians under Section 9124. But there were also two other declarations that were sought and that were denied. When we go before the court to seek a declaration, it's to resolve a dispute or to clarify law. And the first declaration was granted because the court felt it had practical utility. It would help bring people to the negotiation table by clarifying jurisdiction. However, they also refused the last two declarations and denied them because they thought that this area was settled law. What I want to talk about a little bit today are these last two declarations. And the reason I think it's important is because of the connection between law and the development of policy. And I think the reasoning of the court in both of these areas is really quite confusing. And I think it has had some significant ramifications in terms of how this uh, decision is not only being interpreted in the legal community, but also outside of the legal community. So the reasons uh, of uh, Justice Abella on these last two uh, declarations, I think are really problematic for three reasons. The first is that her, her reasons in denying the first declaration on fiduciary duty actually uh, conflate and confuse the fiduciary duty and the fiduciary relationship. And my colleague Darcy Vermette raised this earlier and I'm gonna elaborate on it a little bit here. The second reason is there's an apparent conflation uh, of the Crown's context-specific duty to consult and a broader duty to negotiate a broader range of rights, comprehensive claims, for example, Section 35 rights and rights flowing from breach of constitutional promises. And last but not least, I think the reasoning on these two declarations is also very confusing because she says she's relying on settled law, but the law she refers to isn't particularly settled. So let me just speak to those two things and uh, the confusion that it creates. So what did uh, Madame Justice Abella actually say? She said that the second declaration sought is to recognize that the Crown owes a fiduciary duty to Métis and non-status Indians and that Delgamook accepted that Canada's Aboriginal people have a fiduciary relationship with the Crown, and Manitoba Métis Federation accepted that such a relationship exists, and therefore there is no practical utility in granting a declaration on this matter. However, as I mentioned, the problem here is she is conflating and co collapsing fiduciary duty and the fiduciary relationship. Further, she refers to both the trial judge and the court of appeal judge, and they denied the declaration for very different reasons. So the extent of this confusion uh, I found quite fascinating as I was going through a bunch of different legal commentary on this case. One way to interpret what Madame Justice Abella is saying is on the left-hand side of this slide here. While the government did not grant two of the three declarations, it did confirm the governments have a fiduciary duty towards the Métis and non-status Indians. That is, a duty to act in their best interests, and they must negotiate with them and consult with them. Another interpretation. In any course, the court declined to make the second declaration regarding the fiduciary relationship because it lacks practical utility. This is an incredibly powerful statement that opens up all kinds of questions about what the fiduciary duty entails. 
both of these interpretations of Justice Abella's reasoning on the second declaration assume that she intended to collapse these two ideas together. And indeed, at one time, there was a debate in Canada whether being in a fiduciary relationship meant that the Crown had to always act in the best interests of Indigenous peoples. However, this was clearly addressed in both Manitoba Métis Federation and the Haida case as well. In the Manitoba Métis Federation case, the Supreme Court of Canada held that there is a distinction between the general fiduciary relationship that exists between the Crown and Aboriginal peoples and fiduciary obligations that flow from that relationship. However, the fiduciary relationship calls for a very high standard of moral conduct in dealing with Aboriginal people. And this is what we refer to as honour of the Crown. Honour of the Crown itself is not actionable, but it gives rise to specific actionable duties because of the fiduciary relationship. Now, the Manitoba Métis Federation case said there are two contexts in which a fiduciary duty arises. The first is when we have a discretionary uh, exercise of power over a communal Aboriginal interest. And the second is when the, the uh, government or anyone specifically agrees to uh, undertake to act in your best interest. So the extent of this confusion can be reflected again in the next comment that I'm going to show here. And that is this, while the government did not grant two of the three declarations, it did confirm that the government has a fiduciary duty, oh, pardon me, that they have a fiduciary relationship. And I think that this is actually the proper interpretation. And that is not meaningless. To say that there is a fiduciary relationship invokes honour and does put the Métis in the same position as other Indigenous peoples to argue for all of these other duties that flow from that relationship. The second declaration, I think, is also uh, somewhat problematic. But before I get into that, why do I care about the confusion here between fiduciary duty and fiduciary relationship? Well, this has resulted in a variety of different interpretations and I think has contributed to the misunderstanding that Daniel stands for the proposition that Métis peoples are now entitled to the same benefits as Indian and Inuit or First Nation and Inuit peoples. Uh, for example, if we say there is a duty to act in the best interests of the Métis, this then leads to equality of treatment. And I think that that's incorrect. But having said that, I do think there are strong arguments for equality of treatment of Métis peoples and First Nations and Inuit peoples. I think what happens is when we read Daniels together with the other jurisprudence, which is what a lot of other legal commentators have been saying today, then it's very easy to make strong arguments based on equality principles that Métis are entitled to the same programs and services. So for example, Sebastian Grimond, who's also a member of the Métis Treaty Project, has argued that by similarly situating Métis under 9124, this now takes away all arguments that could be made that they should be treated differently. Because under the Constitution, if they weren't under 9124, there is a basis to argue for differential treatment. So Daniels is extremely important because it clarifies the jurisdiction. And when we read it together with these other cases, it creates very strong arguments to bring the federal government to the table to negotiation. Also, when we read uh, Daniels together with the Manitoba Métis Federation case, this also stands for the proposition that Métis should be included within federal and provincial processes aimed at addressing unfulfilled constitutionalized promises as well as the impact of colonization on Métis people. And we've already seen some positive change in this regard in the recommendations in both the IFORD and the Isaac reports, and as Audrey announced yesterday, uh, the entering into an MOU. Many legal scholars, including uh, Tom Isaac and his report, suggest that although the Manitoba Métis Federation case is the primary beneficiary is the Manitoba Métis Federation of that ruling, it has much far and broader implications for other Métis people, thus calling on the federal government to negotiate with uh, legitimate political representatives of Métis people across Canada. So this then takes me to the second declaration, and that's the Declaration on Negotiation. Justice Abella said this with respect to the declaration uh, on negotiation. This is why she refused to issue that declaration. She said that the Haida Nation and Chilcotin and Pauli 
already recognize a context-specific duty to negotiate when Aboriginal rights are engaged. And she did not issue the declaration because she said it would be a restatement of existing law. However, it's not clear whether Justice Abella is referring to the duty to consult or to a broader obligation to sit down at the table and negotiate more comprehensive claims. Referring to the cases doesn't help resolve this confusion because both the duty to consult and a general obligation to negotiate are referred to in those cases. However, the duty to negotiate is not elaborated in any great detail. Again, a quote from the Haida case uh, uh, and different interpretations here. Again, these are all leading legal scholars or, or lawyers who are arguing these different interpretations because of the confusion in the reasoning that is there. What one lawyer argues is this is breaking through the jurisdictional limits. This is calling us to sit down at the table and to negotiate comprehensive Section 35 uh, rights uh, in situations where we've been uh, refused access in the past. That can be contrasted to this following opinion of another leading law firm which says this. The Supreme Court of Canada's use of the term negotiate appears to be used interchangeably with consult. Since Haida, the Supreme Court of Canada has consistently held that the Crown owes a duty to consult and where appropriate to accommodate. Such duties do not impose a requirement on the Crown to reach agreement with Aboriginal groups, nor do they grant a veto. It does not require the Crown to negotiate. And indeed, Daniels could be wrongly interpreted as imposing additional duties or obligations on the Crown um, than what was intended by the duty to consult. I agree that the terms are used interchangeably, but I completely disagree with this analysis. The negotiation does form part of the duty to consult. However, it is clear in the current jurisprudence, whether we agree with it or not, that there is no obligation to consent. It is still possible for an accommodation to be imposed in the context of negotiating in consultation. However, there is significant reference to a broader duty to negotiate, not only in the Haida decision, but also in the Chilcotin decision and the Manitoba Métis Federation decision. And this is exactly what CAP was trying to argue. They were combining Daniels with the Manitoba Métis Federation case. And what they were trying to argue wasn't that there's a general duty to consult anytime Aboriginal rights are engaged, but they were trying to argue that because of the failure of the Section 37 process to negotiate Métis rights, there is an ongoing obligation to come back to the table and to negotiate those rights. The Manitoba Métis Federation case uh, stands for the proposition that the Crown has an obligation to fulfill its unfulfilled constitutional promises to Métis people. That combined with the Daniels case, in my view, requires the federal government to come to the table. However, I agree with Tom Isaac, it is not just the federal government. The province also has jurisdiction in a number of different areas. And although the province can enter into completely valid arrangements with Métis people, it remains uncertain how those uh, agreements can bind into the future without constitutional protection, for example, under Section 35. And this is some of the, the work that uh, my team uh, is currently uh, working on. So what does this mean then in terms of uh, negotiating with the Métis? I think that uh, Pauli has made it abundantly clear that any alleged uncertainties around identity or anything else are not legitimate reasons uh, to refuse to come to the negotiation table. Of greater relevance, I think, in Daniels and in understanding Cap's argument was the promise uh, of uh, uh, negotiating Métis rights as part of a constitutional process and a constitutional process that failed. And because that constitutional obligation remains unfulfilled, that requires the federal government to come back to the table. Now, I just want to say a few more words about Daniels uh, and the Métis settlements and how it might uh, have potential implications uh, for the Métis settlements. When we talk about uh, the Alberta Métis settlements, um, it's my view that there are uh, four uh, sort of key things 
uh, that we need to bear in mind. And one of them was spoken about this morning by Gerald Cunningham and uh, by, by my colleague uh, Eric Adams. And that is that even though uh, Métis fall under 9124 jurisdiction, it is still constitutionally legitimate and valid for the province to enter into negotiations with Métis people. Uh, and in fact, more recent case law, the Chilcotin decision and the Grassy Narrows decision, make it very clear that when the question is impacting Aboriginal rights, the people who are to be at the, at the table are the crowns that are involved in that. And that may very well be both the federal and the provincial crowns. There is no division of crown when it comes to negotiating Section 35 rights. It's not just this crown or that crown, it is both crowns. So there is no threat currently to the Métis Settlements uh, legislation, uh, in my opinion. Second, I think that uh, legal arguments concerning honor of the crown that we've talked about over the last few days really strengthen claims uh, to Métis settlement consultation and negotiation uh, with respect to rights under the accord. And it compels recognition and implementation and protection of those rights by both the provincial and the federal governments. A challenge for the Métis settlements has been to get their land base protected under the Canadian Constitution. And I think that uh, because the Métis settlements is a negotiated a constitutional promise protected in the Alberta Constitution dealing with Aboriginal interests. This calls on the federal government to come to the table and to provide greater protection for the Métis land base beyond its protection in the Alberta Constitution. The third point I want to make, and my colleagues have pointed this out, is that there is no single legal definition of Métis that applies in all legal constitutional contexts. And I agree with the previous speakers, this does not mean that self-declared Métis groups of mixed ancestry are Métis people with collective historical Section 35 rights. My colleague Paul Seaman and I and others have actually been developing arguments and looking at how the Crown has misunderstood Pauli as it applies to the Métis settlements. And in our view, the Métis settlements do have Section 35 rights, and there are a number of ways that those arguments uh, can be developed and put forward. So last but not least, all of these developments together, they mean uh, that it is time to sit down at the negotiation table and that the settlements have the right to be there to represent themselves and their interests with respect to protecting their rights and their land base. And I was very pleased to see uh, that Tom Isaac agreed with me on that point in his report. And that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kathy. Uh, our next speaker, our last speaker for the afternoon, it's been a long day, I know, um, but uh, we have uh, Paul Seaman from the uh, firm of Gowlings, and he practices in the Aboriginal and Environmental Law Group there. He's advised clients on a number of issues, uh, ranging from commercial, regulatory, and constitutional matters, uh, advising Aboriginal communities, industry groups, and governments on various projects dealing with Aboriginal peoples, particularly the duty to consult and accommodate. He's uh, been active in, in front of a number of boards, tribunals, and courts, as, and including the Supreme Court of Canada. So I'd like to welcome Paul Seaman to the, to the podium. Okay, good afternoon. Um, I'd like to start, uh, as others have, by also thanking the conference organizers uh, for the invitation to join everyone here today and also acknowledge uh, our elders, uh, Mr. Ghostkeeper, Mr. Belcourt, and, and Ms. Campbell. Uh, it's a great honor uh, to be here to discuss the Daniels case uh, with everyone and the very important issues uh, the case has presented uh, to all of us. And I am uh, so very honored uh, to be included on this particular panel with Dr. Adams 
and my colleague, my dear friend and former professor, uh, Catherine Bell. Uh, so I have a few thoughts on particular issues of Métis identity raised by Daniels in some PowerPoint slides that I'll take us through momentarily. Uh, now I realize, of course, that I am in the company of some of the best and most experienced minds on these issues, and I'm also sort of bringing up the rear on the panel. Uh, so I intend to be quite brief and uh, uh, leave some ample time for discussion, but I wanted to lead in uh, with a quick story uh, as was mentioned, I'm a practicing lawyer at one of the big national law firms, Gowlings, and I had the significant honor of acting for Gift Lake Métis Settlement uh, as an, uh, an intervener in Daniels. Um, now, a fun fact about Gowlings, just as an aside, is that it was uh, once called Gowling Lafleur Henderson LLP for many years. Uh, one of its founding partners, a gentleman named Gordon Henderson, uh, was the first lawyer to represent a First Nations person after Parliament removed restrictions in the Indian Act prohibiting First Nations people from hiring lawyers. Uh, this was the Francis case in 1956. So I'm very proud to be practicing at Gowlings and to be continuing that tradition. But I had a very interesting encounter with a good colleague of mine when I first started practicing law. So there I was in Toronto practicing on Bay Street, just a simple Saskatchewan Métis guy trying to work hard and do my best. And I was assigned to work on a big case being litigated in the federal court in Montreal with our top senior commercial litigator. So we rushed through the Montreal airport. We sat down for breakfast one day before court. By this time, we'd been working together for a while. We'd gotten to know each other quite well, and he knew I was Métis. And my senior colleague, his name was Bob, he looks at me across the, the fried eggs and, and bacon and toast and says, so Paul, you've got to tell me because I've been wondering, what exactly is a matey? So I puzzled over the pronunciation briefly. I looked at him and I said, well, Bob, a matey is what you call a sailor on a pirate ship. So with apologies for the bad joke, uh, and yes, I did, by the way, end up uh, explaining to my colleague Bob all about Métis people, by the way. I'll get to my slides now. Uh, so again, given the excellent presentations and thoughts that have come before me, uh, I really only have two points I'd like to make. Uh, I thought I would start uh, with what we know from Pauli in my first slide. The case tells us that Métis Section 35 rights, like Indian and Inuit rights, are collective in nature. So this means that there must be a community or a collective of some kind. And we also know, and we've been talking about this a lot at this conference already, that individuals must be quote unquote accepted by the community. But Pauli also tells us that membership cards don't necessarily count and what's required is instead quote a contextual understanding of the membership requirements of the organization and its role in the Métis community. So moving to my third slide, what exactly a Métis community or Section 35 rights holder, if I can call it that, is or should look like was not really the focus of the Supreme Court's decision in Pauley. And I think this is a bit of a problem because a group deciding who is or who is not Métis is itself claiming to have the right to do so. And this, uh, going back to the title of my presentation, is my chicken and egg problem. Now, Dr. Godry and uh, Mr. Isaac have both noted this issue in passing as well. Uh, and I think it's, it's something we're all sort of uh, grappling with today in the wake of Daniels. And the Supreme Court, of course, itself said in Pauley that it didn't want to be taken as deciding Métis definitional issues in that case and for all time. Now here again, I've quoted a passage from Pauley that suggests that, quote, courts faced with Métis claims will have to ascertain Métis identity on a case-by-case -case basis. Well, that's, of course, all fine and good, but we see some examples here in my next slide where we really don't have good guidance from the courts. In fact, 
here in Alberta, just as an example, we even have the Alberta Court of Appeal suggesting in the Larondell case from 2013 that people who qualify for Métis settlement memberships under a provincial statute aren't presumptively Section 35 or quote-unquote Pauli Métis. So what are they then? This is, of course, a rhetorical question. I believe the Alberta Court of Appeals decision in that case to be absolutely untenable and nonsensical, and Kathy and I have, in fact, written a rather comprehensive paper as to why. But my point is that the case law still really hasn't fleshed out this idea of what a Métis collectivity really looks like. And I think this is important as a legal matter, probably a practical matter too, uh, because Section 9124, of course, has its roots in the Royal Proclamation of 1763, which codified the British Crown's approach in dealing with Indigenous groups. And I intentionally emphasize the word groups. We need to have a better idea of who is entitled to deal with the Crown on relevant issues, and this simply has not come out of any of the existing case law. And finally, my second point is what I regard as a rather troubling passage from Daniels, uh, one that I know that many in this room have read and reread, trying to make sense of. This is, of course, just Isabella speaking. Acceptance by the community was found to be, for purposes of who is included as Métis under Section 35, a prerequisite to holding those rights. Section 9124 serves a very different constitutional purpose. It is about the federal government's relationship with Canada's Aboriginal peoples. This includes people who may no longer be accepted by their communities because they were separated from them as a result, for example, of government policies such as Indian residential schools. Now the first question that comes out of this passage, at least for me, is did the Supreme Court of Canada really mean to suggest or imply that those who have had their connection to a Métis community disconnected by colonial action cannot reforge that link and belong as a Section 35 Métis entitled to, to Aboriginal rights. It seems odd to me, at least, to implicitly allow the Crown, reward it in fact, and belatedly achieve that kind of assimilatory goal. And the second question here is, can a person who is not accepted by the Métis, by, as Métis by their community or a group of these people, for that matter, still be regarded as Métis under 9124? And if so, for what purpose or purposes? And I think this harkens back to some of the excellent and thoughtful remarks uh, by Elder Belcourts um, at the mic at, at the last panel. Um, I'll leave it there. These are interesting issues, and I thank you uh, for listening to my thoughts, and I look forward to any questions you might have. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, that, uh, uh, that ends the uh, presentations, and we now have some time uh, for questions. And uh, uh, in fact, Paul just raised a few good questions. Anybody uh, want to uh, come up to the mic and ask a question of our panelists regarding some of the issues they've raised here? Please, please do so. And uh, as Daniel mentioned before, women first. Good afternoon, that was well said by you folks. I guess my question is, I, it's like everything else, I'm not too highly educated. But there was a, something said to the fact, like I represent a Métis settlement as a counselor, and there was something there, going back to the Pauli 35, Miss Bell, I believe your name is, mm -hmm. said if we're not on her, Section 35, that the settlements could be taken away? 
by the provincial government, something to that effect. Can you clarify that? Currently, um, at the time the accord was negotiated and signed, um, there was a, a movement, and Elmer can probably speak to this better than I, to have it protected under the Canadian Constitution, the land base, and the government. The federal government wasn't prepared to do that because they said it was solely a provincial matter. So in order to try and protect the settlement land base and the uh, structure of settlement government, an amendment was made to Alberta's constitution. And it says that certain procedures have to be followed before any changes could be made to the structure of government or to the form of title uh, or to the protection of Métis land. But it's an amendment to the provincial constitution and there is a legal issue as to whether that can bind future provincial governments. Um, I think it can. Uh, uh, Fred Martin at the time, who, who worked it out, uh, thinks it can. Uh, but, but the stronger protection would be to get it into the Canadian Constitution. And up to this point, the federal government has refused uh, to recognize the Métis Settlement land base uh, through Section 35 or any other uh, amendment to the Canadian Constitution. Is that correct, Elmer? Yeah, the uh, that's right. Uh, thank you. Uh, the Alberta, uh, the amendment to Alberta's constitution also says that this is not an abrogation or derogation of Section 35 rights. So Section 35 rights are not um, dealt with or settled uh, through the Métis Settlements Act, which is one of the reasons I think they're still open and up for negotiation. And the protection of the land base is also something that should be looked at. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Next. Hi, uh, Jeanette Hansen, uh, Métis President for Medicine Hat. And this question's for Catherine Bell. Um, you had a slide up that uh, Daniels was in the middle and then there was Powley and MMF and all these different cases. And there was one I wasn't familiar with and I'm hoping you can tell me what that one was about, the Goslin, Alder, mm. Corbier. Yeah, those were equality rights cases that, that were there, and those are some of the cases that my colleague Sebastian Grimand has looked at to make arguments that now that the Métis are under 9124, one can no longer say that, um, like, like you could argue that Section 15 equality rights um, don't apply if people are in different constitutional categories. But now that Métis are clearly within 9124, you could no longer argue uh, that uh, um, it's okay for people to be treated differently because they're in the same constitutional category. And those cases are some of the cases that he looked at to make that argument. Thank you. Mm. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Just a comment, I guess, more, more likely. As you know, I'm Gary Bailey from the Northwest Territory of Métis Nation. We are negotiating North 60. And that's kind of the pro problem because we, the Métis, we have a very vast traditional territory and we're not negotiating the whole thing. You know, we've had tr troubles at the table trying to talk about uh, just harvesting rights in general in Alberta. And we bring that to the federal government and, you know, they've washed their hands of, uh, of uh, all those issues. Oh no, it's a provincial government, you deal with them. So, you know, I find it interesting that Métis settlements, you know, they're settled and it's not federal. So, you know, they're going to get two kicks at this can here, I think, you know, because they didn't give up their inherent right. So I think it's very, you know, kudos to you. It's a good thing. However, in, a, in our process, that's what they want from us. You know, they're not saying it, but that's what they want. They want us to give that up. So I think it's important that everybody knows what everybody else is doing. So. That's why I'm here, I'll share a little bit of what's going on and I thank you for all your research that you've done because it's very, very interesting to see how far we've come today. <clears throat> but it is really all about our inherent right, our inherent right to self-govern ourselves and own land as well. We can't forget that, I mean, in our claims that we're doing. There's more I wanted to say, but everybody else has been saying it, so I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. Good afternoon. 
I'd like to thank all the speakers today for, uh, for their words and for their information and for um, giving us what they have. Uh, uh, are these papers going to be available to us, these speaking papers, is one of my questions. Uh, Natalie, are you here? Are they, is there an organizer from, from the conference here? I'll, I'll try to later. I'll try to get that okay. answer. Uh, my next question is, uh, well, if I wasn't confused before, I really am now. Uh, you know, really. Will the real Métis please stand up right now? You know, I am getting really quite tired of this. You know, the lawyers are getting richer, the people are getting poorer, and we're no more closer to solving anything, I believe. Uh, we get a little break, and then we fight among ourselves, get another little break, we get all excited. Very, it's very hard. For, for me, I, I'm a leader in the um, Peace River region. I'm so proud of my region and the Métis people. And you know what? We are all, these are all my relations. Everybody here is my relative. Why are we fighting each other? Why are we doing what the government wants? Oh, this is this and this is that and this is that case. And we're all, we're gonna separate it all and talk it all to death. But what are we really going to do? How are we gonna move forward? The time is now for the Métis people to get together, resolve some of these issues, and get together as a collective group, and stick with that. Sure, we don't all live in the same place, and maybe we don't all have the same beliefs, but we all are the same people. And until we kind of look at that that way, this is gonna go on forever. I don't wanna see my great-grandson standing here arguing the same thing that his old grandmother did. We need to get over this and move forward. Thank you very much, everybody, today. I appreciate it very much and look forward to tomorrow. Thank you very much. Um, I, I was just told by Natalie that um, the papers that are being presented, it's going to be part of a publication eventually. Um, at the end of the day, so they'll be made available that way. But individual presenters can make their PowerPoints available on an individual basis if, if they want to. And it's a matter of you asking for them, I think. Um, or maybe we can even have a central place uh, to post them for those who are willing to do that. I don't know. Through the Rupert's Land uh, Institute website, perhaps. Yeah. Um, next, uh, next question. Uh, Kim Bowden uh, with CAP. Um, in one of the, in your presentation, you referred to uh, some uh, cases there. Um, and what interested me was uh, um, some of the case law uh, that you talked about on your presentations. Um, people, well, I'll give you a really good example. Uh, I get a lot of calls from people, uh, particularly who live off reserve, they're status Indians. They've had no connection to their band at all. And uh, they can't even vote. I, I, you know, apparently there, were, there was a case where you, know, uh, you were allowed to vote at one time, but uh, it's funny, when I was driving into, uh, into Edmonton, um, I saw the Saw Ridge Hotel. And I don't know if people are familiar about the Saw Ridge issue with that band. And uh, so I was wondering, um, you have a case now coming down the turnpike here with respect to Dashney, and it was at, at the uh, court, Supreme Court in uh, Quebec. And uh, the federal government's been given an extension, I believe, six months to address that issue. And they have to step out and, uh, and c consult with Indigenous people. And what's come out of that is that, uh, for example, uh, they have hands stated that they now represent all uh, off-reserve urban people, including non-status Indians which I wanted to point that out, um, which I was quite surprised about. They said that in a uh, Corbett decision. They said that's what gave them the mandate to do so. Um, so I was wondering, with, and also with respect to the Dashney issue, the federal government is actually going to be going around consulting with Indigenous people, including Métis people, because it has an impact on Métis people. Uh, you had Bill C-31, you had Bill C-3, now this new bill, and that's the one they're working on right now. And I'm hoping all the legal beagles and the legal minds, how they're going to interpret that one? And how is it going to impact Métis people overall in this whole country? 
Thank you. So it's a very interesting question, um, and uh, you're, you're quite right. The, the dashing issue is, um, you know, there was Bill C-31, Bill C-3, um, and the dashing issue is just going to extend this even further. And as a colleague of mine likes to say, it, it feels a little bit like um, rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic or something, you know, because as Tom uh, commented earlier, Mr. Isaac, he said, you know, this is antiquated, it's outmoded, um, we need to move on, I think, or find a way to move on past the Indian Act and not uh, continue to sort of extend these, uh, <clears throat> these uh, you know, Bill C-3, C-31, these kinds of things. Um, because all that's going to do, and, and Mr. Isaac commented on this as well, is what happened as part of the legislative package in Bill C-31 is they uh, repealed Section 109 of the Indian Act, which was the enfranchisement provision, which had been used for all kinds of mischief by both, uh, I would say, probably the government and, and some Aboriginal people themselves in, in some instances to, to enfranchise people. Uh, but the problem with that, of course, is, as Mr. Isaac said, is now once you're on the registry, you can't get off. So um, the idea would be that it may be enticing for certain uh, people that are now eligible for, under the, the Dashney um, regime, whatever that happens to look like, uh, to then register because it's going to open up a new category of people that are uh, going to be eligible that, you know, they may not truly be, um, uh, you know, First Nations in heritage or, or self-identity, but they may need access to certain, certain things that Indian status uh, provides, which of course then will prevent them from claiming to be Métis. Thank you. I forgot what I came up here for earlier. No. Just on uh, identification, I mean, we look at First Nation people, treaty people. I hate using the term First Nation because I believe we're a First Nation ourselves. We're, one, one, we're a unique group. <clears throat> but anyways, like to identify yourselves as a Métis, you had to come from an Indian. You had to have that blood in you in order to become a Métis. Now we're labeled as Métis, we're less than it seems. You know, it's a battle. We've always fought for equality and, you know, we go back even further to when they signed treaties in our, in our areas. The first chiefs they put forward were really Métis people. And they wanted too much, they knew how to read, and they knew the European way of life. Well, you can't be a treaty, they said. So they went until they got one that they figured they could deal with. He's still some of our members, and he's, that chief is related to us. You know, so it's the same. My point is, not to make the same mistake that they've made, genocide. You know, they're breeding you out. You know, to me, as Métis people, I was glad she said that we're all one, because I don't care how much Aboriginal blood you got in you. That is who you are, and it's who you self-identify as, and you identify as a Métis. So it's important to keep that. We talk about our culture, our practices, the more people we get practicing that, our cultures are going to live forever. So when you're identifying yourselves, you also have a homeland. Like we, People ask me, what does Indigenous mean? It's unfortunate we have to go that way because we're trying to move forward, all of us, as different groups. You know, we're Northwest Territories, for sure, and we have a land base. We're negotiating self-government, land and resource deal. It has to be for that area. So that's why we have this term Indigenous. There's other things that we, we can deal with for people that are not indigenous uh, ter territory pre-government control. You know, it's, it's sad, but that's the way the government's worked. So they still qualify for programs and services and stuff like that, and the fights are gonna be going on forever. It's, it's very good to see youth going to school, because this fight's never gonna end. <laughs> you know, it's been going way back, way before my time. I can tell you that, and we're, we're only getting so far. You know, I think um, government's trying to wash their hands of it. This could go so far back, you look at the fact that they, they've negotiated reserves for Indians. Well, we were here. Why can't we get that? Oh, they talk modern day treaty. No reserve land, nothing like that. There's been groups with 700 people, 790 given $85 million for a claim. Then with the Métis, you come out, 
Well, you got four or five thousand people, here's sixty million. Totally inadequate. It's a take it or leave it situation, so really be careful on, on what you're doing and and talk to other people, you know, but genocide, assimilation, it's no go, <coughs> you know. I also say, you know, communism. I got my own little theory on communist country. We're not that. They can't tell you who you are. We identify ourselves how we want to identify ourselves. That's my my mind, that's how it works. I don't know, I might be out to lunch. <laughs> Nobody's told me that yet. I've told that to the federal government. They didn't like it. You also got to look at all the way they've, they've taken their place into our country, going right back to the missions. You know, how our grandmothers and grandfathers, or mostly grandmothers, were in the missions <coughs> and uh, pulled out of school at grade four and forced to marry, you know, white people. After that, they lost their rights. When did it become a privilege to sleep with a white man, you know? I think our people are pretty, pretty, hey, you know. So I'll just leave you guys with that. <laughs> yeah, no, I agree too. <laughs> uh, anybody else? Um, I know it's getting late and uh, we're probably all a little on the tired side, but I do see Maria Campbell going to the mic, so. No, I'm not. I'm going oh, okay, you're not. <laughs> I th well, I'd like to uh, then extend a, another warm thank you for our panel and uh, adjourn the conference unless uh, Natalie has any. Uh... Oh, no, uh, we'll come back tomorrow. Okay. So thank you very much, everyone.